following Jesus. You know, a lot of people will have different definitions of what following Jesus is. Uh, our following God is, as a lot of people look at it, and and how how do you how do you know to me how do you know the uh, the absolute truth? You go to the source because there's so much out there that you hear different things, and and you know it depletes the truth. And, and almost to the point where, you, what is the truth? So you go to the source. Well, at that time, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and, and, and he, I feel like that he's telling them how they can be true disciples of him. How can they follow him? And a disciple, it basically means a student. And so, how could you be a good student of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, we've, we've accepted him as our Savior. How can, we, how can we be what he wants us to be? How can we take what he's, he's called us to do and do it? How can we really be sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ? And, and he says here in Mark 8, 34 through 38, and I'll read it. He says, and he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my name's sake or, and for the gospel uh, will, be sa will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? For what will it gain, what will a man get, give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the angels. Uh, I want to look at several things here this morning. First of all, according to Jesus, it's a personal experience. I say this because I look at two things here. One of them is the word anyone. And, and you know, or some versions say whoever or whosoever. And, and that is an open invitation for everybody. And it also, if you look at another word in there, it's called crowd. He wasn't telling just his disciples. He wasn't just telling a certain group, hey, follow me. He's telling whoever would listen. And even today, he, he, he's calling whoever will listen to him. There is no closed invitation. In other words, I've only got a certain group that I'm going to talk to. There's only a certain few that I can, I'll, I'll have as a disciple. The rest, no, he wants all of us to be sold out to him. He wants all of us to be a disciple. And, and how can I be used? You know, yeah, it's open to me. I, I, I serve the Lord. I, I, you know, I told y'all before that I got called into the ministry and everything. And, and finally, as I fought it a little bit, because I'm like, me, of all people, I, I, you know, went down and surrendered my life. I just said, Lord, you know, I, I'm going. I basically quoted Isaiah. I said, you know, here I am, Lord, just send me. So, you know, I left. And, and here's where I am uh, on the, on the, uh, in the jungles of Sanford. But anyway, uh, but... You have to have anyone, you know, God calls everyone and anyone to do what they can do. When I was a youth pastor back at Buffalo Baptist Church, our youth group was meeting one day and uh, I said, uh, how can you guys be used? They were middle school and high schoolers. How can you be used? No one had a clue. Because you know how churches are. Most churches, when you're young like that, you don't get, not, you don't get to do anything in the church. You know, we, we like to get ours involved. I mean, we have, when we, did, when we was able to do the offering, you know, the kids come down, we do the offering. We had, Judy has them up here singing all the time and stuff like that. When, went back when we could. I mean, we can't do much now, you know, but, but she did that. And so we, we, we try to get our children and young people in, in, involved in the church because, you know, you, you train them. You know, and, and everything. But uh, I asked her because that was an old traditional church. Kids didn't do anything. Youth didn't do anything. But, you know, sit in the balcony and be quiet. And I said, how could you all do anything? And I said, can God not use you? And I said, you know, and as we was talking about it, 
one of the suggestions I made was, why can you not invite a friend? You got friends. This was back before the cell phones and internet and all that stuff. I said, have you all got friends? Yeah. Bring them. It's the easiest way to do it. Well, I thought, well, as usual, deaf ears, they started bringing their friends in and friends in was coming in. And then it, it, next thing you know, when we had our lock in, I'd have 60 kids in there and all that stuff. You know, and, and, and I, I think that and, you know, caused my hair to fall out or start falling out. But anyway, and, and I'm just saying that, that and then after, after we started, I asked him, I said, did you think God could ever use you to the point where now a lot of these kids were getting baptized, saved and baptized. And I said, did you ever think that you could be a part of this? You see, God does not not call you. God calls you where you are. Now, some he'll call to the mission fields. Some he'll call. To, but God calls you where you are. And when we sit down and say, well, God ain't calling me. Well, maybe you're not listening. Maybe you got a closed uh, heart. Maybe you just don't want to do it. But God lays stuff on our hearts all the time. And, and he's not talking just to his disciples. He's talking to the crowd, which is, gives me the idea that he's saying everybody can be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's an open invitation to be a disciple. And, and, and it, it's a personal experience. Whoever, it's me. I, I, I get to be a part of it. You know, I've told you all before, uh, I love sports. And and when I was a kid, I loved sports so much. I, I think I think I would have really got along good with Eli, you know Eli Neal here because you know how sports crazy he is. Uh, that's how I am or was. I'm not now. I'm too old. But and Jeff, my little brother, the same way. And we shared a bedroom. And every time we'd have a ball game, we thought it was great to put on our little league uniform, our basketball uniform, or, or put on our football uniform to go to the game. And what would happen is if I had a game. Jeff and I, would, I'd go put my uniform on, Jeff would watch. And then vice versa. I mean, we was only six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old. So I can't, and, and, and as we got 30 and 40, we quit watching each other dress, you know. But, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, but what I'm saying is, is that I was so proud to put on a uniform to wear, you know, because I felt like I was a big league ball player. I felt like I was just something else. And I'd walk around real cocky because I had a uniform. And... and, and <sighs> When I look at a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to put on the armor of God. I want to put on the uniform of Jesus. You know what I'm saying? Be proud of who you are in Christ. Be proud of the fact that, that you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Be proud that he can use you. You know what I mean? 7.8 billion people on the face of the earth and he calls you individually? You think about it. You know, we're coming up on election time, and, and you know, you, you, you go in, you pull your lever to vote who you want, want in. Well, you know, you know your candidate the best you can. You go in and you pop the lever. Well, Jesus knows us even better, and he looks at us and he says, you'd be a great job for this. Every successful church, bar none, has dynamic lay people. And what I mean by that, dynamic people in the church who's willing to get out and do things and, and, and use their gifts and talents for the Lord Jesus Christ. There's not a person in this congregation, there's not a person that, that's not important to God that is not usable to God. God can use every one of us however he chooses. The problem is we have to realize that we are usable. You know, you, but I'm just a small fish in a, in a big pond. Who cares? You know, you know my little world, you know, I, my little world ain't very big. If you think about it, my little world's in Lee County just about. I mean, I don't go out, hardly ever go out in Lee County unless I'm going up to Raleigh or back or Southern Pines or back or, you know, you know something like that. But you know what I'm saying. I mean, I know I've got family in Tennessee, but, but my, my little family right here, my, my little world's right here. Well, I know I can't do anything in China and Japan and all those places, but you know I can do stuff in Lee County. 
God called me to be here and be here and do the best we can. God called you and put you where you work, do the best you can there for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you all have hobbies. We all go on vacations. We all have different friends and stuff. Be usable there. But you've got to have that open heart. You've got to have that uh, availability. And, and I'm going to tell you this right now. If you say God opened the doors, he's going to open the doors. You know. The other thing I want to look at, according to Jesus, it's a personal decision. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Oh, I need this. Uh, now, I'm not going to go into all this. I preached this before, and I've also used it on my Facebook uh, a devotion and stuff like that. But basically, it is to, to sell yourself out. It's, Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So all my dreams, all my hopes that I had, I gave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that I can't go out here and play golf or, or, or fish or whatever. It doesn't mean that at all. What it means is, is that I have given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm going to be used the way that he desires to use me. That's what denying yourself is. no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. See, when we surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, we surrender our, our, our lives Everything about us, we surrender to him. You know, give it to him. And let him use us. And then, and then take up your cross. You know, Jesus wasn't the only person ever crucified. That was the capital punishment back then. You know, there's two thieves there. You know, they didn't just say, oh, well, this, hmm, how can we kill him? Oh, crucify him. It was in the Bible. No, it was been around for a long time. So when they said take up your cross, oh, everybody knew exactly what that meant. Die to yourself. Die to yourself and then follow Jesus. Follow him. You know, not a better person or th to follow than the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I'll say this, and, and, and is that following Jesus, you think, well, that's easy. Just let him lead. That's hard. I'm going to tell you why. Because while he's leading, the, the devil is trying to deceive us. He's trying to do everything he can to get us off base. He's trying everything. But we have to sit down and make that decision on our own. Nobody can make it for us. We make our own personal decision. This is what I'm going to do. And we, we stand firm on the foundations of the Lord Jesus Christ. We say, I am going to follow Jesus. Now, does that mean I'm always going to follow him and never do, get off to? No, no, because we all sin, come short of the glory of God. We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to, you know, make, get on the wrong road. I mean, I don't care if you got GPS or not. They'll take you in a ditch sometime. You know, you, I don't know if y'all have ever done it, but they'll, they'll get you on a road. You're like, what? In the old world, especially if you get out, there's no signal. You know, you get out there. Y'all ever been out there where you got no signal and it just it keeps telling you to take a left? take a left take a left the next thing you know i passed that house four times you know what i'm saying but but the whole thing is 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 that that we cannot follow anybody and have a true following or be a true follow. you know what i'm saying because people are going to lead us the way that they feel and it's usually selfish well maybe you take take our politicians and I'm not getting on the either bandwagon I'm talking about both is is this time of year I love how they promise us so much stuff that they know absolutely no way they're ever going to deliver and, and they'll they'll tell you all this stuff here's what I'm going to do and you saw on the Democrat convention you're going to see in the Republican convention they're going to promise us so much stuff and, 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 and everything that if you follow them, man I don't even have to do nothing they, they're going to even get me machines where I don't even have to breathe <coughs> you know they're just going to do everything for me and it's going to be a when they get in there this is going to be a, a, a euphoric event it's going to be paradise Four years later, they're promising the exact same thing they did 12 years ago. I mean, how many times can, are they going to try to save Social Security? They've been saying it since Ronald Reagan's era. Around in that area, you know. Uh, and, and all this stuff. We're, not go, we're going to do this. We're, you know, we're going to build the wall and the Mexicans are going to pay for it. All this stuff. And a lot of people bought into that. Oh, yeah, I can't wait till they get those pesos over here. They ain't going to do it. You see, we, they say whatever they want to get you only one time every four years to go in and pull that lever for them. 
And after that, it's basically the same old, same old. Am I wrong? Well, I know they had the midterms, but you know what I'm saying. But when you follow Jesus, if you say, I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, he don't care about our one-time vote. We follow him because he loved us before we loved him. That while we were yet sinners, he died for us. You see, he cared a whole lot about us. You know that old song that used to say, sing it, and I've used it before. It says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. You remember that song? You know, that, that is basically true because I'm not saying he said, this is for you, Steve. This is for you. And I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is he went to the cross. He sacrificed his life for all of mankind, and that includes all of mankind. And when he died on the cross, that shows that he gave us everything. And so to follow Jesus, yes, it's hard. It is hard to follow him. It is hard. Listen, you cannot follow Jesus and go into Walmart and not come out repenting of your sins. Amen? You go in Walmart and you, don't, you come out. If you ain't, you ain't repenting of what you thought and what you did... Something wrong. Your spiritual life. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that is a hard place to go into. I was in there not too long ago, and I'm like, I got to get out of here. Or drive Horner Boulevard sometime. Or listen to people. You see, it's a personal decision. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you make that decision to say, I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to take up my cross, I'm going to do everything that I can for him. It, when you make that personal decision to do so, I want to say this, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make outside of your salvation. It'll be the greatest decision you'll ever make because there's no greater I don't, person to serve than the Lord Jesus Christ. He, 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 you know, I've said this before, as much as our family loves each other, as much as you all love your children and your grandchildren and all that stuff, that's not even a drop in the bucket to what God loves us and Jesus, how much he loves us. And the other one is, it, it's a choice. I mean, I know the decision, you know, to follow him, but it's a choice. Do you like spiritual life or do you like, to, what are you going to do to gain your own soul? What do you mean, what are you going to do to lose, to lose your own soul? What does it profit a man if he gains his whole, uh, gain the whole world and lose his soul? I mean, what does it, what does it profit a person? This is what I tell people when they, whenever they don't want to accept Christ. Uh, I'll say to them, what does, when you get to the end of your life, what did you accomplish that would cause God to say, man, you need to come on in. I mean, you cured this, you did that, you worked hard all your life, you raised your family, you need to come on in. I don't think he's going to say that. He's going to say, what did you do with my son? You see what I'm saying? So it's a choice. And it, then, then even when we, when we accept Christ, and we're, we're, it's a choice to where we want to be sold out to Jesus or we want to be sold out to our physical life. What gets us up of a morning? Is it our job, our families, whatever it is, you know, and all that? Or, you know, uh, or do you get up saying, well... Today is the day that the Lord has given. Let us rejoice in it. Now, some days you can say that, but at the end of the day, you don't really want to say it because you can have tough days. I know. We all have tough days. We all have days where, where, where you wish it was, uh, you know, you, you know, past you. You're like, man, if this day's ever over, I'll be happy. You know, but, but, but you have those days. But what drives you? Is it spiritual? Is your spiritual life more present than your physical? Or, or, it, or, or is your physical life more precious than your spiritual life? You see what I'm saying? Did I say that right? Physical, present. I mean, sometimes I, I, get, I get up here and I don't think when I speak. Amen. Hallelujah. But anyway, but what is more important? What is the most important thing in your life? And whatever it is, that basically is your God. 
That's why he called it an adulterous generation. It wasn't everybody going out cheating on their spouses. What that adulterous generation was is you were choosing all these gods. You're out here following all these gods, I mean, and, and everything. You remember all through the, uh, the Old Testament, how they go to the Canaanite God, and this God over here, and this, and everything. And even in the New Testament, he comes in, and, and, and Paul goes to all these, all these places, has all these gods, and the Romans had their gods, and everybody had their gods, and people were following everybody. Every little god that made them feel good, they followed, which is nothing different today. Because we follow gods that makes us feel good. Do you think about it? We have to have some kind of temporary happiness. What would make you happy right now? Me to shut up and go home, right? Amen. <laughs> Me to stop, right? Steve, shut up and I'd be happy for at least another week. But anyway, no, well, what, what would make you happy? I mean, you think about it. And, and somebody may say, man, I tell you what, like, like me, my truck, my truck was, you know, I think it came over on the ark. But anyway, uh, and I'm like, man, I'd like to have me a spanking new truck. We'd be riding around. I put the big rims on it, have it set up to where it's like this. You ever know so trucks now are low in the back, high in the front? And I'm like, how do you see over the trunk without standing up? You know what I'm saying? Or over the, you know, the hood there. You, you know, and I saw one yesterday. We was out and... There was one, and, and, and I, I, it, was, it was like this. had these big old tires on it. You know, you know what I'm saying. And it was low in the back, and it, was, it looked like it, if he'd have leaned back, it would have popped up and everything. And, 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 and that was, boy, that tell you, I would look good. Man, I could be, I'd pimp that thing out. You know, I'd pimp my truck, pimp the Pope Mobile. But anyway, I'd be, I'd be out there. I mean, I'd be styling and profiling and uh, and all that. You know that I, that would that would make me happy for about six months, because everybody buys a new car, washes it, waxes it every week. They'll wash it. They'll get it all cleaned up. After a while, you see it. It ain't been washed in three months, six months. You don't care. When you first get a new car, you don't let nothing in the front in your in your car. You don't let trash in there. You wipe down everything you do. After about six months, there's cups, Starbucks cups, McDonald's cups, all that trash in the back. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I've been in cars before. You open the door, it all falls out. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Here, let me get your stuff in there. You know what I'm saying? That's how we are. Why? Because we got to have something that gives us that temporary physical euphoria. That's why when they come up with a new phone, they'll be lined up three miles down the street to get that new phone. When Apple comes out, what's the next Apple? 30? 12. 12. 12. Okay. I got to have the 12. My, my, my 11.9 don't work. So I got to have the 12. You know what I'm saying. Or when something else new comes. Yeah, you know, and, 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 and clothes. Now, the, the, you know, the, if you go back and look, uh, fashion makes circles. You know what? That's right. Hang, hang on to your clothes. Do you know that, that, that you know, the shorts that everybody, all the girls wear, and I'm not talking about the girls, they wear those short shorts, you know, their jeans, the cut-off jeans. Those were popular in the 60s. Go Google Rowan and Martin laughing and see if that wasn't popular. Or Hee Haw. How many of y'all watched Hee Haw for the music? Not a man in here to say that. Amen? <laughs> I watched it for the educational <laughs> part of it and the comedy. Well, they're coming back. In, they're in style now. Here's the thing. You don't talk about saving stuff. My mom saves her clothes. She saved her clothes. Do you know that she still has clothes out in, the, in, in her building in a cedar chest that she wore back those days? Now, I'm going to tell you what. If I go visit her and an 86-year-old woman wearing hot pants, I'm going right back home. <laughs> I'm walking out that door going right back home. You know what I'm saying? But what I'm getting at... <laughs> is that we all want something new. And something new fades. You think about it. Then we got to have something else new. And then it fades. And it's an endless cycle until we get to the point where we don't care what we got. 
Well, see, that's physical. That is the physical is more precious to you. Spiritual is this. I'm content where God has me. And I'm going to roll up my sleeves and work for him. I don't have everything I want. But I'll be sure to tell you that I got everything I need. You know, there's a list of, I got a list of things I'd, I'd like to have. But I've got all I need. And that's the difference. You see that, that, that when, when you're sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ and you care more about your spiritual life and you put it first and it's more precious, all this physical stuff really doesn't mean a thing. Doesn't mean a thing to you. Now I'm not saying if you got it you're living in sin. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it doesn't drive you. Nothing wrong with having a new iPhone or a new truck or, or a new this. It's not wrong. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, if that's what drives you every day, then it's more physical than spiritual. If God is what drives you every day, your relationship with Jesus drives, that's when it's more spiritual than physical, if that makes sense to you. And that's what he's talking here about, gaining the whole world and losing its own soul. And then the last thing I wanted to look at, uh, whoa, i got plenty of time, Brad. I can go on forever. It's a personal response. Verse 38, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, sinful generation. I hope that we're not ashamed of who we are in Christ. Now that shame doesn't mean that I walk around, you know, hide behind everything, cow, you know, all that stuff. A shame just means that I don't, I, 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 like I hear people say, well, spirituality is, 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 is personal and you need to keep it to yourself. Yes, it is personal, but I've not heard in the Bible where you keep it to yourself. Go ye and make disciples. You know, and, uh, but... Are we ashamed to really stand up for who we are in Jesus Christ? You see, that's the response to it. Is, is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of who he is. I'm proud. I'm proud of him. And I make no bones about it. Y'all know. You, you, you all do the same thing. You know, I'm not ashamed of it. I don't hide I don't hide Jesus in a closet. I want him out. You know what I'm saying? I like the fact that, that he's, he is the most important thing in my life. And, and talking to people, I mean, I, uh, there's a, a Christian, there's, there's a lady at the gym that's, uh, well, she, she comes in up and works out, kind of stays to herself, normal, which doesn't last long around me. You, you stay to yourself very long and you're going to have me sitting beside you talking to you. You know what I'm saying? And, and if they got earphones in, I just pull them out. Hey, you want this bud back? You better listen to me. But anyway, but uh, uh, she was there talking. And, uh, she was sitting there one day and I walked by her and I said, Hi, how are you doing? And we got to talking and, and everything. And, and uh, I asked her about, you know, she was a general talk and I asked her if she, she went to church anywhere. And she said, yeah, and she goes to a I can't think of the name of it. It's the one on Henley Road. Uh, you see the vineyard. It's something else now. She said, I, I sing in the praise team. I, my husband does the sound there. All this stuff. And it was just, she was just going on and on about it. And then we got to talk about it. And now all of a sudden, every time we meet, we say, how was your Sunday? How was the Lord treating you? You don't, you don't talk about it, don't you? And she's just as sweet as she can be about it. And I just love to talk about it because I, you find somebody who's not ashamed of the gospel, they can elevate each other. Because when I see her coming in, or she sees me, we always make sure we talk about how God is doing today in your life. You see, if we were ashamed, nobody would know. Paul said, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of it. I... Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I'm going to stand over when I say this, Brad, because you, you and Jimmy are going to have to get my back. I'd be ashamed to wear a North Carolina t-shirt. 
You know what I'm saying? At the university. Of North, uh, Ronnie, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? I'd be ashamed to wear one of those. Oh, oh, hey, Drew. <laughs> I better stand over here. But, but, but I'd, I'd be proud to wear an NC State one, right? Amen? Amen on that? I'm picking. Y'all know I'm joking with you. Y'all know I'm joking. I don't care about either one of them like that as far as that. But, uh, but what I'm getting at is, is a shame, man. It, it, being ashamed is, is, is another word for be, denying it. He says to deny yourself, not to deny Christ. You see what I'm saying? We don't want to, to just live our lives as if in seclusion of who we are in Christ. Now, I don't put uh, stuff in my yard, you know, flags and all that stuff. Uh, but I do have on, my, on, our, on our vehicles the Good News Baptist stuff. And I have, you know, the, the Thank You Jesus thing. I can't, there's nothing wrong with that. I've got a couple of shirts and everything. That's not what I mean about being a king. Oh, I ain't going to wear a shirt out in public. I'm talking about living for him. Just sell yourself out to him. You know, you know what I'm saying? Just every day make it a Jesus day. And every day make it the greatest day in your life. I don't care if it's a Monday. You can have seven Mondays in a row and you can make it a great day. Amen? Because you want to be used by the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, you know, in his words, he said, he said, just, just come ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Give it your life to him and I'll let him have what he wants, what he wants to do with you. Let him have it. Don't be ashamed to tell somebody how much Jesus loves you. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed to say to somebody, you know, I love Jesus. Don't be ashamed to say, what is your relationship with the Lord Jesus? Don't be ashamed to stand up when somebody's saying something uh, that's wrong in the Bible. Don't be ashamed to say, well, here's what the Bible really says. You don't have to be ashamed of it. I'm a firm believer. The reason our country is the way it is is because our churches closed their doors and let the world go right on by. Uh, until somebody convinces me otherwise, look at them today. You don't see churches doing a lot. Why? It's all about me and my four and no more. That's all I need. I'm, I come in here. See, the only reason I come to church is to get away from the world. Well, if you only come to church to get away from the world, you're wrong. You come to church to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you may not be of this world, but you're in this world. And they don't hate you. They hate Jesus. They hate who you represent. And when we stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ and we stand up and not be ashamed of who he is, listen, we can take this country back. Well, we're only 50 people. How can we do it? Well, how many can you touch this week? How many can you encourage this week? How many can you talk to this week? How many can you do that? Do you ever count how many people you come in contact through a week? Some of y'all probably millions or, you know, thousands. Of, you know what I'm saying? Just in your jobs, you're all, you're, a lot of people. How, how many do you, figure it out one time. How many you come in contact? And then figure out how many people have you really tried to encourage that day, uh, uh, you know, to hang in there, to, you know, to let God have you. How many of you have done that? You see where I'm going with this? We come in contact with a lot of people. So don't say, oh, it's nobody. Let's take our country back. <laughs> it's all I can say. Let's take our slave. Let's take our, let's take Stanford back. Let's get that little Durham reputation out of here, right? <laughs> Those of you in the police for you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> back there, say, mm. Let's pray and we'll be done. Father, we thank you, Lord.